Hello and welcome. My name is Tobias Schwartz. I'm a veterinary radiologist specialized in CT. And today we're going to cover the topic in our lecture series, when to use CT. So the indications to do an orthopedic CT are the same as doing an orthopedic radiographs in principle. But there are certain areas that we more commonly perform with CT and the vast majority of orthopedic uh, CTs is, is the elbow joint in the dog. I would say that about 80% of our CTs are elbow CTs and it's a phenomenal development in, in elbow disease, the use of CT. Uh, initially we performed radiographs with the CT because the surgeons and the students also at the university they wanted to see, compare this to what they were used to on the, on the radiographs. But since, and we kept that option open um, and even included it in the price. So if you want to have the radiographs, we'll take them with you. But then about a year or two later, people, the vets, the clinicians, they don't really want the radiographs anymore. Uh, nobody wants to spend the time. You don't really diagnose many of the elbow conditions specifically enough on the radiographs. And everything that you need to know, you can see on the CT. Um, so you can identify all the different elbow pathologies. Other things where we use CT frequently is for foreign body searches, which works not always. We don't always find that. Um, it is very good for the tarsus. Uh, for osteochondrosis and fractures, and we use it for uh, surgical planning for the pelvis. And now increasingly we use it for the shoulder and then also for the carpus. Uh, most of our orthopedic CDs are not under general anesthesia, they're just with a dormitor sedation. And so you have to figure out a way to make sure these dogs stay in position and don't fall off the table. Um, the slice thickness that you need for orthopedic CTs, you should have it really thin, thin sliced bone images, and then in addition a soft tissue series that uh, kernel that's a little bit thicker. And currently we don't really routinely perform intravenous contrast in most orthopedic cases. But I think we probably should do more of that, but because we, there's probably things we're missing. But um, and there are other of my colleagues who say that you should do a contrast CT. Sometimes what we do now is that if we find an obvious lesion, a coronoid fragmentation or things like that, we won't do it. But if we don't find anything and it's a lame dog, then we would do it. Um, as far as the anatomy is concerned, we recently published a paper on, on using cont a cont CT astrography for the shoulder joint. And that is useful if you are looking for cartilage pathology, uh, soft tissue. Oh, okay, sorry, this is about intravenous. So again, I think I covered that already. Anything of a swelling um, or muscle, muscular issues, that's where it's potentially useful and we probably should do a bit more of that. So the CT arthrography has been published for the shoulder, elbow, and stifle joint in the dog. I think it's only useful in the shoulder. In the elbow joint, I don't think this is really making any big difference clinically. And in the stifle joint, there are two or three publications about CT arthrography in the stifle. And they are, have mixed results, but also in my experience, the distribution of the contrast medium is not very um, equal it's throughout the joint. And because of that, you have filling defects and then you cannot really differentiate your filling defects from meniscal tears, which is usually the, the purpose of this CT astrography of the stifle. So I do not recommend doing stifle CT astrography. I think it's just a whole mess that you see there and it doesn't really help you diagnosing what you're trying to answer. But it does work reasonably well in the shoulder joint and you do get results there. 
for, I'm gonna come back to that. For positioning of, 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 of orthopedic conditions, what you always want is that the structures that you have should be kind of in the middle of the gantry. And everything that's away from that center, uh, you should try to get rid of uh, by moving this away. Uh, because that means that these peripheral structures cannot create streaks that go onto the structure you are interested in. And these are, for instance, different ways to scan the elbows. So the issue here is that the head, if it's moved, if it's in a normal forward position, will create streaks that will animate, or uh, that will reach the elbow joint, and they can mimic fissures, for instance. So this is kind of the way we do this. Other people put them in lateral with either both legs or just one, but I think both together is fine. The two elbows together don't really create ma too many streak artifacts. We're currently trying to investigate that, wh what the best positioning is by doing a study on this. That's just kind of how we do it. You, we, I don't actually put anything between the legs anymore at the time we did. And then we have something to support you on the side uh, and then legs bent back and wrapped in Velcro. These air passages are still free. And that's how you can scan them efficiently. Well, the shoulder joint, um, most of our shoulder CT requests are in combination with the elbow. We would start in the position that I just showed you, head away and we'll do the elbow. And then we unwrap the dog and just put the head in the middle and then do the shoulders without making a new scout radiograph. There's, it's the same position. And for the shoulder, we have a soft tissue kernel and a bone kernel. We'll then make a decision of whether we're gonna do intravenous contrast or not. And after that, we would con we would consider doing an, a CT arthrography if we haven't found what we were looking for. If you do the CT arthrography, he would clip and prepare the joint just as you would do for synovial synthesis, and you would uh, uh, inject and put the dog in lateral recumbency with the affected side, the injected side down and the contralateral limb flexed. So this is the position here. So this is the affected limb that was just injected. So this goes forward. You wouldn't want to have that electric lead here. And that other leg gets pulled backwards. This way you don't have the other leg superimposed. And this leg is down, therefore with respiratory movement, it doesn't go up and down. And this is what you can see. Uh, with the arthrogram, you can see the biceps tendon and the transverse humeral ligament. You can see the glenohumeral ligament, the medial one and the lateral one as well. You can see the biceps tendon surrounded by the bicipital tendon sheet. Uh, if you have them in a flex position, then the area of interest will be with in these, between these two bones and you won't be able to see this properly. So the extension is really important. And particularly if you're trying to diagnose an osteochondrosis desiccans, so you can see the cartilage flap and the contrast running underneath it. So this will not be possible to see if they're in contact with the scapula there. Four to five mils, four in a small dog and five in a big one. And the concentration is pretty low, 70 or 60 milligram iodine per milliliter. So if they dilute it quite a bit. Um, here are some examples of pathology. The supraspinatus uh, inserts on the greater tubercle. So here we can see the mineralization and the swelling of that muscle, but before contrast, you don't really know whether this has any effect on the biceps tendon, but on the, 
arthrogram, you can see that the biceps tendon is really squeezed. Can you appreciate that? Because these uh, insertional tendinopathies are really common uh, in dogs. They're often bilateral and they are of equivocal significance. They're not always clinically relevant. But in this case, it's a convincing argument to say this does cause pain and discomfort because the biceps tendon doesn't have its normal position anymore. The infraspinatus is also uh, visible uh, and you can get tendinopathy there. So you can see the, uh, the, the encesiophytosis at the site of insertion and on the arthrogram you see the swollen mus muscular thickening there in that area that you wouldn't expect to see. Another thing with the insertional tendinopathy is that um, you can see calcification in it. These are, this is the bursa of the infraspinatus tendon that can calcify. The infraspinatus is the only muscle of the shoulder that has a bursa. It has actually two. One constantly and another further proximally, occasionally. And so you see these round calcified bodies that are these calcified bursa with these uh, chronic tendinopathies. I've seen those and reported have often in different type in young dogs insertional tendinopathies uh, where the, at the site of insertion they have these uh, cystic expansion of the bone, it's bilateral, it can be associated with lameness as well and particularly in Rottweilers this has been seen. Well, I've seen it in other dogs as well. But again, I think this is one of those, like many other orthopedic conditions that you see, we don't really know how clinically relevant these things are. Um, so subscapularis insertional tendinopathy is also well visible on CT. And here's an example of a biceps tendon rupture. So you can see the fiber rupture here uh, in the biceps tendon. And you're by now used to these curvilinear reconstructions where I stretch out the path of these curved structures. The brachial plexus, um, we see more and more brachial plexus lesion um, and CT is one way to work them up. Alternatively, you could do uh, MRI for them, which would work very well as well. Um, but I think with CT, you can possibly the MRI will give you a little bit more detail about the brachial plexus tumor and also the invasion into the spinal cord, but you can see it on CT as well. If it's not clear cut a brachial plexus lesion, then maybe with CT you get more information about other potential causes of lameness there. So this is a trauma case, so this wasn't an, uh, this is a rupture or thickening of the nerves. And also it has been reported with, with foreign body. So just because you have masses in the brachial plexus doesn't always mean that they are neoplastic. But what's relevant is the post-contrast study where you're trying to map the entrance of the brachial plexus nerves into this vertebral canal, into the spinal cord, because the prognosis for the ones with intraspinal involvement is much worse. And then possibly, normally you would consider an amputation, but if they already entered the, the spinal cord, maybe you wouldn't go for this invasive surgery anymore. Elbow joint. Um, the fragmentation of the coronary process is probably the most common disease that we diagnose. What we see is a fragment or a fissure line in the area of the cor medial coronoid process. There's adjacent sclerosis or lack of trabecular bone. We may see kissing lesions, hyperostosis, and there also is often joint incongruency. If you look at this joint, this is not congruent here anymore. And here you see the fragmentation and the new bone formation. But we now see more and more subtle fragmented medial corner process, such as this one, just a small little fissure here. Uh, 
through the medial coronary process, but there is, I think we need to reduce the, the put the cover down a little bit on the side there, because that's, I think, where this comes in. Yes, that's good, perfect. Um, you can see there's also adjacent sclerosis in this area, so it's not quite normal. And there's also a defect here in the, what I believe is a humeral condyle. Again, the more we look at them, the more variations we see. You can see the sclerosis here, and you can see there's like subchondral defects in the incisura radialis. Here's a small fissure. Again, it's all too sclerotic. This trabecular bone should reach far further into the coronary process than it does here. And these are these cystic lesions in the radial incisor that are kind of similar what we see in navicular disease in the horse. We don't really know what they exactly mean, but you see them with this disease. Again, also you can see the, the um, sclerosing, the new bone formation, and you see the fragmentation here. This dog has a medial coronary disease and a fragment ununited unconeal process, which is doesn't really make sense from a physiological point of view. The theory was that fragmented medial coronary process develops because the um, <coughs> the radius is too short, so all the weight of the humerus sits on the on the medial coronary process and then it breaks off. But then the, the theory of the ununited unconeal process is exactly the opposite, um, where the ulna, ulna is too short, so this is hitting against that and it prevents this unconeal process to fuse. So how could you possibly have both? It's probably that these two theories are not exactly true. <laughs> Or that there is some temporal asynchronicity in the development and first it goes this way and then it goes the other way. Or a combination thereof. It's probably much more complex than what we think. I do have to say that fragmented coronary processes are really common. Whereas I see less and less of these ununited unconeal processes. And I used to see much more. So I don't know why, but they don't seem to be that common anymore. They only used to exist in certain breeds anyway, and maybe we see less of these giant breed dogs now, and that has something to do with that. Kissing lesions refer to a secondary aberration of the subchondral bone, secondary to a medial coronary lesion. So you have a kind of linear subchondral bone le lesion and surrounding sclerosis. And that is supposed to be separated from a, a true osteochondrosis of the humeral condyle, where you have a more plaque-like loss of subchondral bone associated with also with some sclerosis. In some of my colleagues, like Henry von Brie, that they look totally different. You can totally identify them, but I don't, not really so sure that you always can confidently differentiate the two. And again, here's a question mark case, we're not so sure. The OCD is a more round defect, and the kissing lesion has a more striated appearance. But one thing that we do assess always, and that is important, is looking for incongruence. Because what is painful for a dog and may cause lameness is actually the incongruence. So it's really important to look at that in, in in sagittal and in dorsal planes. And I do, however, not really, I'm not a big fan of measuring the incongruence. First of all, there are like three different ways of measuring this. And they have the points how this is measured are all done slightly differently. So it's difficult to compare them. And they are these not they're not really good points to compare them and it I think if it's obvious then I don't need to measure this if it's so subtle I'm not going to be trusting my 
two 1.6 millimeter measurement to make a clinical diagnosis out of this. So um, I think it's a subjective assessment. Here's an example where we did post intravenous contrast uh, uh, in an elbow joint, which we don't often do. Um, so you can see this her dog has an elbow joint with massive new bone formation. This is, I believe, all degenerative joint disease. And we gave contrast and you can see the joint capsule here and this is all effusion. So what this tells you is there is no mass that was here. Uh, so you ruled that out. And it's an unusual case. We don't see this very often. So this would, you know, this dog has made this DGD for a long, long time. Why is it lame now? Um, is there some mass in here that we can't see? So there would be an example of a reason why to do in contrast, intravenous contrast. Incomplete ossification of the humeral condyle uh, is very common in spaniel type dogs, uh, but you also see it in non-spaniel dogs. And it's very often the defect is bilateral, um, but the fracture open fracture may only be unilateral. CT is excellent to diagnose these. You see the fissure line and you see the surrounding sclerosis as well. And it does change. It gives you more option as a surgeon to, to deal with that. Either you can do a, a preventive surgery on the opposite side, or at least you can discuss that and make the owner aware of that the other leg may fracture as well. There is still controversy whether you should do preventive screwing of these fissures because the, the screws are not really well designed for the forces they're put upon, so they may break, and that makes a big mess in fixing them. And even with the surgical techniques we have, this doesn't fuse. You just keep it together. So there's still some issues with this. Here's an example of a panosteitis in CT, something you would probably easily see on, on radiographs, but since we are CTing more elbows, we need to know how this looks like, and you have this really classical fingerprint lesions in the medullary cavity, which you then see here on the transverse images as well. Another interesting disease that uh, raises a lot of debate are uh, minimizations in the antebrachial flexor uh, muscles and tendons. This is on the medial, on the, along the medial epicondyle of the humerus, and these are often bilateral, and they're often seen in large breed dogs like Labradors. And uh, I don't think there's really a consensus in the surgical community what to do with these. Most people I speak to would, would do as follow. If you find other pathology, like a fragmented coronary process, that explains the lameness, you ignore them. If you find absolutely nothing else, and the, and the mineralization is unilaterally, you would surgically remove it. Um, they are very common. This is an example of a neoplasia in the elbow joint, and you can really see already how different this looks to the degenerative pathology that we saw earlier on. You have irregular periosteal reaction, you have osteolytic destruction, and there's more than one bone involved. And in post contrast, you have the swelling and also some mass type lesions here. Um, I just have some examples here of things. Uh, this is a retained cartilage. Oh, that's supposed to be a metaphysio osteopathy. Um, just to see how that looks like on CT. The, uh, the new bone formation um, in the metaphysis. Uh, I think we're going to skip a couple of those. Angular limb deformity. All right. So the angular limb deformity, um, CTs are now proper, commonly performed and for surgical planning, if a corrective osteotomy is, is desired. But 
There are now also several papers on how to measure the virus and the valgus angle and, and certain other angles as well. And, and they are really difficult to measure in a consistent manner because you have to do this when you are in the multiplanar reconstruction or possibly in 3D if your software allows that measurement. And every person, if you have three different people, they will use slightly different points because it is really difficult to, to be consistent where this point is. And so that means you then get three different angles and they are sometimes pretty far apart. And this, it doesn't really increase the confidence in the technique that we use. So rather than arguing endlessly about these measurements that are just inherently difficult to properly do, the way forward, in my opinion, with angular limb deformity is to print them out. To me, that's a straightforward indication for 3D printing. And that's where you need the CT to do that. And it's easy to do and quick and it's for planning purposes. Then your surgeon doesn't need to have this bloody angle. He's like, here's a leg, you know, cut it up, make your wedge, whatever you want to do. And, and it's a better way forward to deal with these cases. Also, if it's a unilateral angular limb deformity because of some sort of gross plate disease, we obviously can also uh, print out the other leg for you. And that way you have the normal and the abnormal. Like this is what I want the leg to be. And this is what it is. And with some tricks, what we could do, if you ask us to, is we could probably also um, invert to, if you want, if you have a left angular limb deformity, we could trick the system into making believe that the right limb is the left one. So you get a printout from abnormal to normal without having the change of symmetry. But, you know, we can make the right limb a left limb. Print it out mirror image. And that way, you, you know, where you're from and where you want to go to. Hang on. Carpus. Uh, for the carpus, uh, and tarsus as well, the, the advantage of CT is that you see very small fractures. And again, these are sometimes difficult cases to work up because there is lameness, there is pain on the carpus, and there's nothing else anywhere else. So to see things like this, small metacarpal fractures, and really see which bone is it really, that makes a difference. Or look at this, this uh, C4 fracture here, that little thing, it's not really big, is it? MC3 fracture. This is where I wish I would have put some arrows in. Tobias, yes. Do you actually do stress CT? Like you would do a uh, I have done it. It's a pain in the ass to do it, but we have to edit that out. <laughs> <laughs> um, I want to find my C MC3. One, two. I th think it's that's the fracture here. Yeah, I think. One, two, three. No, sorry, that's the fracture. Yeah, pretty sure. I would have to go back and forward to be sure. But they are, they, they, you have to go back and forward and really look for that in detail. But stress CT, uh, we have done it. It's, it's not really so easy. I think that's one thing where I probably would send them back to radiography and just do stress in those, each of those directions. It's easier, it's quicker to do it in radiography. Particularly if you practice in, in a country where you hold. Like in, in Sweden you hold, right? So then it's just, it's a big faffing around when you have to do this with sandbags and all this stuff. So, uh, but if you hold anyway, then it's just quick and easy. And in CT, yeah, it's doable, but it's tricky. And this is an example of a foreign body. You can see it's, it's dense. It could be a piece, it said calcified, but it's just dense. It could be a piece of glass, for instance. Um, so CT is, is often helpful in finding small foreign bodies in the digital area, but we're not always successful. So if you have MRI 
for foreign body, they are often a little bit better than the CT to find them. But if you don't have it, CT is still a good option. Here's an example of very interesting lesion. A dog that was painful on his uh, front, on his marnus. And what you see here is this sclerosis of the bone. But then the lateral obliques are just difficult. They're too much superimposition, not so helpful. But you can see it has a fracture there. Somebody stepped on that paw of that dog, and it has this, this dorsally oriented fracture, and it's healing now. So, this would be really difficult to identify on CT, uh, on, on radiographs. I think, was that the same one, or is this? this? Yes, it's the same one. And the periosteum is intact, which is why I think this is a green stick fracture. Just a little bit fractured there. This is, uh, was a swollen, painful toe. Um, uh, we CT'd it, and you can see the osteolysis and the pathological fracture of the basis of the P3 bone. And I, at the time, I, I didn't really, this was one of the things when, when you just rush, you, you think, okay, it's a tumor done, yeah, pathologic fracture, and it wasn't. So it's a, this was a proliferative synovitis. You probably know, the, do you know the villonodular synovitis in the horse and the fetlock joint? They are, they are just space occupying and they cause bone atrophy in the adjacent bone. They just push the bone out of the way. And you can have that in other species as well, it's just far more common in the horse. So you, just because you have an osteolytic lesion uh, affecting the, the, the digital bone doesn't mean it has to be an, an aggressive neoplasia. There are benign reasons for that. So, and it just obviously changes the prognosis of this dog significantly. You know, if this was a melanoma, dog would probably not have a good prognosis, but that you can just remove and it's fine. So again, we we'll have to be careful and not to be narrow-minded. And, and secondly, <coughs> uh, you still need a biopsy. A CT is not a microscope. And I think <laughs> any attempt to pretension to do that is just going to fail. So. It's a macroscopic imaging technology, same as MRI. There are very few exceptions when we can make a histological diagnosis such as lipoma, but it's like a very, very few of them. Pelvis and hips. So pelvis and hips, um, so for the hips, we don't use CT much. Um, and I don't really see that we really need it. I think radiography is fine for it. For the pelvis, I think the advantage is the planning of surgery for pelvic fractures and to see whether the acetabulum is involved in the fracture. If you're really eager and you want to diagnose hip dysplasia on CT, you can. But I don't really see an advantage over simple radiography. It, you know, you have less super, it doesn't change anything, I think. But for pelvic fractures, it's obviously very helpful. Uh, but to me, this is one of the few things where the 3D reconstruction really helps. This isn't really that intuitively to look at this that way and to see which bone uh, belongs to which bit. That's more helpful to look at it this way. And those are quickly and easily done. Sacral fractures as well. So here's a sacral fracture along with it. That's good. And neoplastic conditions. This is an osteosarcoma with a metastasis. Oh, remember I told you that post-contrast, 
you don't want to look at a bone CT. It's not helpful. This is an example of this. So this is the osteosarcoma, which is osteolytic. And I think this, I'm not sure whether this is a post-contrast or not. But on the post-contrast, you can see here, you need to have a narrow window to be able to see the contrast enhancement. But by making the window narrow, all your bone is now really white. So at this point, you are assessing the soft tissue component of this metastasis here. And you see it's in the soft tissue. But you're not really saying much about what's going on inside of that bone. You just can't. So that's the reason why we don't want a post-contrast bone kernel image. It's useless. And now I do remember what else I want to tell you. Um, on many CTs, you, particularly on the Siemens ones, you have the option to do reconstructions sagittal and dorsal and export them to your packs. Um, and many of you like that because you don't have Osirix and other ones, you just work with that unit and then you have those images, which is obviously reasonable and fine. But the image quality that when we in teleradiology look at them, we, we make our own reconstructions and we want to be able to adjust it to the anatomy and not just have this one series. So when you send us these, these sagittal and dorsal recom, we immediately throw them away. We don't want to see them. We don't care. So they clog up the system and they're completely useless to us. So if you need them for your purposes, fair enough. But if there's a way for you for not sending them to us, that would be really good. Hang on. We want to go too fast here. Um, femoral head physeal dysplasia. So um, this, is, has, this disease has several names. Um, and one of them is uh, a physeal slip fracture of the femoral head. And these are typically seen in male young cats. And they are seen without any trauma history. So this isn't a traumatic disease in most of them. You can obviously also have a trauma history with it. And it's some sort of dysmaturia of the growth plates which leads to this uh, fracture. And that's why it also got the name physeal dysplasia. But again, you will find this under several different names. The same disease also occurs in dogs, but less frequently. Um, this is the dog component of it. And that is where CT is more helpful. To see these slip fractures on radiographs isn't always that easy. And CT is pretty nice to be able to visualize those. In dogs, they're much more rare, but they also occur there. And this is an example of a 3D. Uh, and it's a dog with retroversion that's based on the location of the femoral, femoral head and neck in relation to the uh, greater trochanter. And it's the same issue as with the angular limb deformity in the front leg. Um, there are people, and I see that Jens is smiling, there are colleagues of us who have spent their entire career on these measurements. Um, about the people who claim, for instance, Schawalda in Switzerland, he claimed that there's, there's a difference between hip dysplasia and femoral antiversion. And this is a completely different disease. And, but it's, it's all very theoretically, because the measurement is really, really difficult to obtain. And again, in CT, it's better than on these radiograph, where you have to use trigonometry to do this. But nevertheless, you have three different people. They will come up with three different measurements, because it's so difficult to be consistent in these measurements. And they're needed. Do you know why you want those measurements? This is all about the appropriate treatment for patella luxation. Because they want to find out, is the patella luxated because the tibial crest has an abnormal position? Is it because there is 
a distal femoral torsion or is it because the proximal part of the femur is torsed? And based on that, you would choose a surgical technique that addresses these issues most appropriately. That's the theory. And there are also the Q angle and all this kind of stuff. And I think, again, these measurements are really fraught with, with huge difficulties. And the best thing is to print them out. Yeah. It's much more easier to do it on a radiograph than to do it in surgery. Yeah, yeah. yeah. once you're in surgery, you, you, it's hard to replicate that, what you just did. So I think but 3D printing is, is, is somewhat helpful uh, if that's what you want to do. Stifle joint. See, I think CT does not have much to offer for the stifle joint. Um, it is not really useful for cruciate rupture. And it's not useful for meniscal disease. And I talked about the astrography problems. You can disease diagnose things like osteochondrosis, but they are relatively rare. There are not many of them. But yes, that would be an indication. Uh, so here you can see the defects in the condyle there. Joint effusion. I think we're going to skip over that. I was, this is a desperate attempt to find something about the stifle joint where you could use a CT. So all I can scrape together was this. Um, this is an example of a gastrocnemius musculotendinopathy where the insertion point of the gastrocnemius is abnormal and that can lead to pain and discomfort. The dog also have other issues, the lateral digital ten uh, extensor tendon sheet is, is also uh, has bony encroachment there, so it's not just one thing. Coming to a more fruitful area, which is the tarsus, and the, the biggest disease that we would diagnose here uh, would be osteochondrosis. You can see the defect here in the trochlear ridge. The dorsal reconstructions are really helpful. And here you can see the subchondral bone defect. Mm. Uh, the CT helps you to differentiate between medial and lateral trochlear ridge lesion, which may help you to guide your astroscopy into different areas. So if you have tarsal disease, CT is a very good option as your first differential, as your first diagnostic imaging tool. Another disease that's kind of cool is um, centrodistal uh, tarsal DGD. Um, if you know uh, bone spavin in horses, dogs can get the same thing where they are central and they are uh, distal and there's mm, third tarsal bone fuse and that can lead to discomfort and, and lameness as well. And it's relatively common you see that and medium and border terrier type dogs. They get a pain reaction from the medial tarsal rotation. Um, and it's just very similar to bone spavin as well in horses. That, you know, with surgical promotion of ankylosis, then that's a, that's a successful approach to this disease. And Tarsus fractures are excellent visible on CT and all the details of it, which bone is fractured where, and um, that helps you making the decision. Here's an example of a physeal infection of physitis, an irregular loss of, of, of bone that was seen in a dog with a portosystemic shunt. They're more prone to get these kind of infections because they are uh, liver doesn't clear out the toxins. And of course, skeletal metastasis. And that was it for the orthopedic lecture.